Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as he said, I'm Ron Miller. I'm the enterprise reporter at TechCrunch, and I have the privilege of interviewing this rather prestigious group here today. And we only have 30 minutes, which is really a short time, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, in his keynote this morning, Patrick told a story about a customer, a Fidelity customer, and his password had been compromised. And the person basically said, it's your problem. You fix it. And he was right. And so my question is, why are we putting the burden on users? And how can we make it easier on users and take that burden off them? Why don't you start, because it's your party, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Bob Lakely here a couple of years ago talked about um, recognition and the fact that in real life we don't authenticate. You just recognize people. And we have right. all the mechanisms to do that. So I think the vision here is that the devices are getting smart enough to where they can recognize us. Simple as that. Right. Yeah. But not yet, right? Not yet. We're getting there. Well, so I'll, I'll say that I'm not going to answer this question because this is one of the questions I intend to answer tomorrow morning. That's not a lie. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, uh, for the record right now, you know, that, that this is usually characterized as a choice between placing the burden on the user and placing the burden on the relying party, and those are not the only possible choices. <clears throat> there you have it. So how, how would you resolve that, that tension then? I would do that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't steal my thunder, I think, is what we're hearing. Sure, so Eric Sachs from Google, I've got an answer for you. Uh, government, national IDs, right? They might rely on the governments, and they'll fix it all. Uh, the reality is, in many ways, we're already relying on them. You know, the poor users, they lose their Google account, and it's been stolen. It's like, great, I'll send a code to your phone. Oh, wait, your phone's been stolen? Well, why don't you go into the phone store and show your government ID, and they'll issue a new, a new phone. At the end of the day, we, we are just, you know, like, turtles all the way down, and we haven't found a way to resolve all these problems yet. Well, I mean, so it's not, I mean, it's not turtles all the way down, right? We do, <laughs> the, we, we, there's, a, there's a turtle string that leads you uh, to the passport office, and there's a turtle string that leads you to the bank branch. And you know those things aren't perfect, but they're a lot better than a string of uh, relatively indistinguishable bids. Yep. I don't even know what to make of that. <laughs> um, so, so wait a minute. So there's burden like on the individual. Okay, that's a right. bad idea. But then there's assigning responsibility to the enterprise, right? So we had to differentiate these things. Where it's an individual customer, then we talk about burden that's assigned to them. But if I'm talking about another organization on the line, you know, on the other end of our chain of trusted turtle droppings or whatever it is, um, then then I think it's fair to talk about like there's some responsibility about your practices because we're all in this boat together um, and you know we should make sure you're empowered to do the right things but you're also responsible for doing the right things. I don't know, an idea? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think it's everyone's problem to solve uh, and I also think that we have this terrible pervasive opinion that users are stupid and cannot change and that friction is the thing that we must bow down to is some sort of heathen god, right? That right. we can't change any tiny little thing because there might be a drop off in web traffic and that leads to us not even being willing to, to be creative and to try new things that maybe users will actually understand better than the old standby. Well, so, but there's already a pre-existing argument against you on this. I'm not going to take sides in, in the fight because the, the guy I'm gonna cite isn't here and, uh, so he can't beat me up and you can. <clears throat> uh, but Don Davis, back in the, uh, in the bad old PKI days, wrote a paper called Compliance Defects in Public Key Cryptography in which he talked about burdens that PKI placed on users that were in some sense impossible uh, to sustain, right? And so while I agree with you that we should try to do things that are better than what we do today, there may be things that we can't make users do uh, to, you know, in, their, in their own interest, and we need to be aware of that. Yeah, but that may be true, but I mean, how many of us at scale, or enterprises at scale, can test what is and isn't effective from a usability perspective? There yes. are a few, right? Like, you guys are doing amazing work, and you guys are doing amazing work in this, but that's atypical, right? So when we say things about, like, well, this introduces friction, or this may cause a drop off, as identity professionals, we're swagging a lot of time on that, right? We have a hunch. But our hunch is usually based on like what mom or your dog would do on a mobile device, and that doesn't necessarily correlate to reality. 
I view it as an opportunity, not a challenge, that uh, in the trade-off between convenience and security, which we know where that lands, we know where the turtle droppings land ultimately on that one historically, it's an opportunity for us to be innovative and clever about now how we use all these smart platforms that are with us. And again, we didn't have these six years ago, seven years ago, mm -hmm. and now we do. It's just a new era for yeah. us to figure out as an industry how we take the burden off of the user, yet improve the security all around the system. I think it was Patrick earlier today who asked a question, how many people here had worked with user experience, uh, you know, experts in design? I think I saw eight people raise their hands. I'm pretty sure five of them work for me. <laughs> uh, and we're actually at the point where I have, on average, two UX designers for every product manager in my team. My team's pretty large. And it, it, again, it is very much focused on yeah. this stuff. And we've actually found a, a lot of the things that we, we thought we couldn't get users to do, actually, uh, we're, we're making more progress than we thought. They're, they're always extremes. Um, but I would say there's, it's progress, but man, is it brutally yeah, hard. Really hard. Right. I think it's what the, so I agree with Eric's point, which is that I think you really ultimately have to keep the user experience in mind on this. Like I always like to remind my team that, look, the, there is this problem where if I'm forcing you as an end user to learn a new thing, it better be worth learning the new thing. So like a few, you've probably experienced this. You've probably gotten into, maybe it's a BMW. They seem to do it all the time. You get into a BMW and they've changed the layout of the damn automatic <laughs> stick. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> automatic sticks always go park, reverse, neutral, drive, and you can get in and you can just go. Right? And so if you get into a, a BMW where they've messed around with it, like especially at the rental counter, right, you get into the car and you're like, oh my god, 15 minutes later, maybe you actually are proficient back on the road again. Right? And so the benefit of the, even though I'm sure they've done all kinds of research that shows it's 12% better or something. The benefit it's, it's of the Dvorak change keyboard, right? Yeah. Right. The benefit that's of the change a, is not a, worth the work to learn it. So I think you have to have the that kind of trade-off in mind which is people have a set of standard interactions that they are that we've over 30 years trained them how to do, right? And they know that a username and a password box means a certain thing and they know how to, you know, deal with that complexity. So I think we have to just keep in mind that as we change things that incremental little changes that make you learn are not necessarily good. We've got to find an experiment with big big things that make it worth to you to go, okay, I'm going to learn this new thing and then we need to use it consistently uh, across the industry. Well, and there's a lot you can do with changing the semantics on the back end without changing the user interaction totally. at all. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, like so <clears throat> typing a password, right? So Passwords are evil, but if you have uh, one of these behavioral systems that uses the accelerometer to figure out how hard you tap the screen and everything, so typing a password, doesn't, the, the actual letters that you type don't matter. What matters is you know, your, yeah. your proficiency as a human being in manipulating the device seems the same to the user. It's a lot harder for the bad guy to crack. Yeah, I think that's, a, <clears throat> like we really are trying to get the team to even think that way, which is look, the password is just one of 100 different data points that we're going to evaluate. Yeah. And if the other, you know, if there are 70 of them that all look good and you got the password wrong, eh, maybe we're just going to let you in. Yeah, because right. you know right. what? The, the, it's just one signal. I don't think we should get too hung up on that one specific signal. Well, and there's other signals that, like, the real users never get right, right? Like, you know, what's your favorite movie? It's like, I don't know what my favorite <laughs> yeah. movie is. <laughs> like, but there's all kinds of identity <laughs> thieves who do. Right? So that should be a negative correlator. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, a couple of personal experiences. One, I, I, you know, I work for TechCrunch, which is owned by AOL and will soon be owned by Verizon. So there's a big bureaucracy that sort of sits above me. And there's this concept called the CCID that I have to change you know, every 90 days or something. And I don't really interact that much with the corporate system. But I had to go in, and I had to change my, my ID, and I, I had the questions, because I couldn't remember the thing, of course, because I never use it. And, you know, I, I, I answered the questions and like, no, you know, and then I had to call a number and go through, through, the, through the process. And it was a serious pain. And it was so, so painful, I didn't want to do it. But I finally, I had to do it because I couldn't get my email. So, you know, those are the kinds of burdens I'm talking about, you know, and the theoretical burdens that you guys are talking about that you can, I mean, the theoretical ways of reducing that we're not seeing that in large numbers. We're seeing still, I've got to tap in, you know, and I'm good about passwords, so I have these complicated passwords, and I've got to tap it in, and I'm always making a mistake, and I have, I have to start again. So, you know, just to sort of throw it back out there, there's the theoretical and there's the actual. So why aren't we better at this? Why, why are we still tapping in passwords or typing in passwords? Well, because when we it's do a know stupid about? interface design, right? I mean, right. like, how, how many people <laughs> use GPG for mail? 
raise your hand if you use GPG for mail. Come yeah. on. This so, yeah, there's like four we got one. guys <laughs> in the program. Even Facebook will let you do this Justin's now. Right. So, so, the, so of the people who use GPG for mail, how many of you turn on the option that says, show the letters when you type your passphrase? Yeah, me too, because it's so long that I can't do it without mis... I mean, I can remember it. I can't do it without mistyping it. Huh. Ah, oh, yeah, yes. So, okay, so, uh, so, so Edward Snowden thinks you're an idiot. But, <laughs> but I, so I actually thought for a long time about that. I mean, every time the box comes up, I look at the little check mark, and, and I, I really, I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's whispering to me. It says, please check me. Right? And I, so far I've resisted, but I'm not sure I'm going to keep doing that. Well, I would actually say your story is very relevant. So in, in Google's case, we find about half of our users, they log into Google again on average two years later at the point where they replace their mobile phone. Right. So the chances are at that point, not only have they forgotten their password, they tend to have forgotten their username. Right. So uh, then they're, who, who's asking, they're asking the carrier for help at this point. So some of the carriers got smart. They realized this would start to happen. So they said, oh, well, when I set up your phone the first time, I'll just put your username and password in our record in the back end database. And so if your phone breaks, I'll just go <laughs> look it up and enter it. And so we, you know, Google, we dug this hole for ourselves. But we now, our team, who is our account recovery team, they're the primary group that we're investing resources in. We're actually finding account recovery is our common flow for sign-in, it's not the sign-in itself. And then yes, you need to use, you know, give the user every single option they can to have a chance to get back into their account. Yeah, and the but person you know, you know, on the even, phone with me is like, you know, do you know who this person is? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm given a name. He's like, no. I'm like, how about this person? No. <laughs> you know? yeah, at which point does this conversation start to seem weird, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, but he's really, he's like, he wants me to succeed, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the help desk always wants you to. So a uh, little anecdote, we, uh, Salesforce IT, we, so Salesforce product, we've had an oath-based one-time password generator for like a long time. And we're like, oh, hey, maybe we should use that. Seems like a good idea, right? So we'll roll it out. So Salesforce IT is like, okay, we're rolling it out. I happened to be in San Francisco the day it was being rolled out. And uh, <laughs> my boss, some of you know, Seabort, was like, uh, you probably don't want to go to this floor, this floor, or that floor. I'm like, why is that? It's like, well, that's where IT is stationed, <laughs> and they're giving people T-shirts, free T-shirts, if you come and set up two-factor off. It's like, but as a product person, you may want to just stay away because you may get caught in the blast radius. And the point was not about the product or the technology. It was about all the cultural stuff we had to overcome where we have, I don't know, I'm team gazillion salespeople. And they're like the most patient people on earth next to doctors uh, on IT systems. And basically it's like, what, what do you mean I have to do this? And then the thing with the, oh no, like heads explode, you know? So getting over the cultural stuff, Alex pointed out, we've had three decades of habituating users on a certain set of ceremonies. You don't just undo that, right? Like if you always put on your pants left leg, right leg for 30 years in a row and are told you gotta jump into both, that's a real hard shift. Right. But I do think we're starting to see the emergence of some things that are clearly better. I mean, as much as I hate to admit it, putting your thumb on the iPhone you know, for all the security problems with it. That is a nice sign-in ceremony. It's awesome. Yeah. Right? It's awesome, right? And now it unlocks my watch, too. Yeah, there you go. Right? That's a nice sign-in ceremony. And like Eric's pointing out, <clears throat> the, the initial proof up of your device sucks still, right? But the experience once you've proofed up your device of putting in a, you know, a pin or whatever is, actually, that's not that bad, right? So those are definitely all getting better. I think we're making, we're getting to the point now where, in fact, you can see some general patterns that really are that, like, 10x better to make you want to shift away. And we're still trying to figure out kind of those edge cases of, yeah, well, what is the, the core proof up that you use to be able to do that, right? And there's just more work to be done. Well, I remember um, in an interview, Marissa Meyer saying that she didn't block her phone because she said she would be putting in a pin 75 times a day to check her email. And when, when the, uh, the, the fingerprint thing came, it changed her life. And I think it did for everybody because a lot of people didn't bother with a pin, even though that was the most basic form of security if you lost your phone. Mm. Like for, for a lot of people, if you lost your phone and somebody finds it, unless they're devious and they know how to get at that four, four number um, pen, you know, it's a brick to them, right? You know, they can't use it. So, I mean, just having that, that fingerprint is a huge step forward. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, you know, because it takes, it takes what was kind of a difficult thing for a lot of people, even though Four numbers is not a big deal, but you know people weren't doing it, and people will do their fingerprint. And I mean, 
it just changes the dynamic. Well, and it makes it so much less likely that you'll die in a car accident. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, so the, 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 oh that's what Touch ID is really <laughs> cool. yeah. 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 We don't need self-driving cars. We just need more of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. When are those? When do we get one? Uh, I've got mine. You don't? No. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. The, the scary one for that is the just iris scan. Right, right. So you're driving along, and <laughs> that's that's never good. <laughs> I think we've had a huge disconnect, too, between you know, all the friction that we used to put in front of people would only un unlock a couple of items. So of course, I think it was, it, it was met with a lot of resistance. The combination of whatever the improvement in ceremony is and the perceived, perceived friction to the reward, which is I can unlock a lot of things, all of a sudden changes. And we haven't done a good job at connecting the friction that we put in front of people with what they're going to get. And so, of course, everything is like, why are, you, why are you putting another obstruction in front of me? Once we connect the dots between the risk or, or, say, the friction and the reward, I do think that people will be more receptive to it. Well, and things like HomeKit and Nest and what have you, I think, are really going to accelerate that. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some horrible, <laughs> yeah. you know, sort of initial experiences <laughs> there. But, but I think you, people are going to get more and more used to yeah. these sort of proximity and, uh, yeah. you know, and sequences yeah. of operations with, you know, like things unlocking each other. Yeah. Right. I'll be surprised if a year from now, when we have this, the same discussion, if we are all, if everybody in the room hasn't had numerous experiences where you've walked up to a PC and it's logged you in, or you've thumbed yeah. in on a phone and it's logged you in, and right. it's starting to really feel much more natural. Yeah. So I think we really can see with the, all of the work that's being done across the industry how we're on the, the cusp of, the, of it getting radically better pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But then you're going to have all these other things, right? So like the, the Captain Kirk walking into doors blooper reel, right? Because you know, there'll be all these things that you're used to just automatically turning on, and you'll go up to it, and you'll think, it's broken. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, that one hasn't been yeah, yeah, yet. yet. <laughs> That's like my friend's two-year-old, you know, who, who only knew an iPad, walking up to the TV and wondering why it didn't, oh, didn't yes. do that. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> laptop. Let, let, let's switch gears because we're already through like you know a lot of time here. Um, yesterday, you you talked about the spirit of cooperation and the need to fight a common enemy, and you had that great slide of of uh, of uh, King of Thrones. And um, you know, my, my feeling as I was sitting there was like, yeah, you know, come by, ah, it's great, you know, everybody's going to cooperate. But at the end of the day, a lot of the people up here are rivals, right? I mean, they they. They, they may want to have a common goal of keeping everybody safe, but they also have a common, you know, an individual need to be a business. So, so my question is, how do you come together to resolve those big problems while not letting all that politics get in the way? So yeah. how about it? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. But you told <laughs> there you go. Exactly. I, and, you know, Microsoft is, okay, is crazy. I, I have this list where every you know, couple of weeks we've got to do a check-in because there are like 30 different areas where we're working together on common identity and security standards. We can even you know, mess up coordination across that list. But in many cases, yes, you know, the hacker at the end of the day is our common you know, problem in these cases. And you know, at Google, hey, I have to worry as much about the user logging in as Internet Explorer or Apple Safari as I do logging into Chrome. Right. And I think vice versa is true with the Microsoft accounts, Xbox accounts, et cetera. So I'd say our interests are extremely well aligned in these And I, th I mean, it's easy to see that, right? So how many people in this room do you have their cell phone number in your phone? I mean, it, <laughs> if you're anything like me, it's like 30, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but I think the other thing is, it's not just a common enemy, it's a, a common uh, customer, right? I mean, how many people here have at least two of the vendors represented by this panel um, as customers, right? It's got to be... It's a good number. Yeah. It's a good number. It's not as many as I thought, but when, you know, when those big customers you really want to actually work with come to you and say, this needs to work with this competitive product, then you're motivated. Well, the, 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 the business that pays for this conference only exists because of that. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of to be said for for leverage, right? So if you think about what happened with DMARC and email spam, right? A couple of big providers who have heavy leverage said, "We're going to do this thing to make everything better because it's in everyone's best interest." I think there's a lot of that spirit in the identity world of simply saying, "Look." We have the you know, premier federation solution you know, that for years, like, we're going to make sure that this works with these other big service providers because everybody uses these things together. I'd I, I say the steel thread through here is definitely the standards. Right. Let's all agree on the standards, and let's all agree on the patterns and the methods and the frameworks and the best practice. 
All of those things can be kind of common knowledge, if right. you will. The implementation of that is really where we should differentiate. Right. Yep. It's sort of well, like the open source model, right? Well, yeah. let, me, let me maybe push back on that a little bit, because the, the one thing that you said earlier that I think is in the gray area is the ceremony experience, right? So if you get in and the steering wheel is on the other side, or if it's, have you seen that wonderful video with the guy riding, the, the smarter everyday guy riding the backwards bicycle? Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so we don't want to create the backwards bicycle through product differentiation. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I, I would say, you know, this market is not fully mature. I, I would say I would call this that if we were a living organism, we're a single cell organism at this moment in time. And the move from a single cell to multi-cell is massive. Mm -hmm. Ian, you talked about it a little bit. The business model of identity will change. Yep. Um, networks, when we network, networks hate redundancy. And the first thing to collapse as we strive for more efficiency is redundancy is the place that we look. What's more redundant than identity proofing today? What's more redundant than authentication today? The truth is, and I, I heard this a while back, it's a horrible analogy, but I like it. It's like identity is a ding dong. It's got a hard outer shell and a soft <laughs> inner shell. Well, what's the hard outer shell? Ultimately, I believe that it's really good identity providers. Those are the people that proof, and those are the people that authenticate. It's probably not everybody doing it over time. The business model will have to change so that the identity providers that incur that cost get paid for it. Um, ultimately, and, and many millions probably will rely on the inside of a hard outer shell. In that process, I would say the authentication ceremony, if you will, some people will do it great. Some people will have great support. Uh, I said the other, uh, this is a couple of years ago, I was on a flight and they had uh, direct TV for the first time. It didn't work, and so I asked the attendant, I said, could this be fixed? And she says, not my problem. She goes, that's direct TV. <laughs> and my comment was, federated support sucks. <laughs> because everyone can yeah. point a finger at somebody else. Yes, totally. And so that is a huge issue. What happens when our federated identities messes up? And who's responsible when everyone's pointing fingers? Yep. Yep. Well, and I, I mean, I think, you know, his, history bears out your analogy, right? We have all relied on the hard shell of a highly trained identity professional working in the labor and delivery room and, yeah. and writing things down on a piece of paper for a long time, right? It's essentially, you know, single source, hard outer shell, probably not as good these days as it was once. Yeah. Well, that's interesting too. Though. So I don't know how many of you have tried to use Wi-Fi on airplanes, right? Speaking of the yeah. flight attendants saying it's not their problem. Well, that's how, it's, that's an attack surface yeah. right there, right? If it's not her problem and there's no one else in the plane, right? We will never ever see an announcement come over on the plane saying, is there a geek in the house, right? <laughs> that will never happen. Well, and why is that? Not after that guy claims yeah, right. That. right. Why, why is that, right? Why, why are you willing to trust a complete stranger to self-assert that they are a doctor and literally, you know, try to bring a, a human being back to life, but we can't operate on United Wi-Fi? <laughs> Maybe if we solved that problem, I, I don't know what would happen. But, well, but the downside of, of not having anybody respond to the me medical emergency is a lot worse than the downside of not having anybody not respond having, to the I Wi-Fi. Don't know, slow internet, that. no oh. internet. Oh. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, so question for you. Uh, the, the, the idea of standards and a platform and building businesses on top of that is a tried and true yeah. practice, as you know. How far along are we in that vision? And you know, what work still needs to be done to get there mm. so that we're not calling for a doctor on the plane? <laughs> so. I think Ian had it largely right. I think you know, it's been the last, what, eight to nine years worth of effort, really ramped about that period of time. It's accelerated. We're darn close to solving a lot of problems today. They don't automate. They don't necessarily scale the way we want. Maybe we haven't connected all the other pieces to the identity backplane that we need to do to get to a complete solution. But certainly most of what we're talking about is pretty achievable with some bright people and a little bit of, you know, not duct tape, but putting them together the right way. Yeah. I think it's very I think achievable. That's right. yeah. we, have the T we probably have the TCP IP. Yeah. No, you know, <laughs> and now there's a lot of work to do above it. But yep. I think we understand the base underpinning now and don't have to spend a bunch of time going back and redoing that. Now we can start innovating on top of that and finding additional layers of value on it. Yeah. I'm probably more pessimistic, I would say, on the enterprise workforce case. I, I agree that we're there trying to get the average consumer website to stop being toxic waste. I think that would That's be a, a long much way harder yeah, yeah. way to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we only, I mean, we're down to like five and a half minutes here. Um, <laughs> but I want to ask one more question for you guys, and I think that's probably going to take us to the end. But it seems like every week there's a breach, right? I mean, last week there was that, that breach in the government, you know, the anthem. This, I mean, you know the list. I don't have to go, go down it. Um, and it seems like it's often related 
to compromise credentials, right? You guys are the credentials experts, so why aren't we better at protecting these at this point in time, and why are the credentials still the weak link? Well, so there's, there's some wiggle words in that question. Because, <laughs> and, and here's why. The lawyer coming Here we go. Well, well, no, 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 because yeah. protecting credentials. What are we yeah. protecting? Are we talking about salted hashed file with everything in it? Or are we talking about what Josh talked about earlier today, which is the individual is the gatekeeper uh, of letting in good or bad. Right? They want to get to their stuff. They want to do their thing. And so we're asking all of our identity defense mechanisms, in a lot of cases, down to the individual to make the right decision. So when we say protect our credentials, does that mean, well, we have to harden the way we actually have password and hygiene and everything around that? Or are we federating? Or does it mean we're asking a user to be the vanguard of our entire enterprise and protect to their death right. what we have? So Protect the credential is a squirrely space, and we can't, and the problem is with a lot of ways, without knowing all the nuance of what happens, it just comes across as, we need like longer passwords or something. Well, that's not the answer to protect the credential. It's much more nuanced than that. I know Andre was pointing out earlier that for you know, consumer accounts are becoming more and more viable. Maybe we can get users to protect more there. I think the, there's the reverse problem that's becoming more attractive for the hackers. If they do break into the system now, there is so much more for them to get access to. Yeah. So the value for targeted attacking, phishing has gone up dramatically in the last two years. And I'm not sure we're keeping up with that level of threat even on the enterprise. Well, I think you could demonstrate by the statistics that we're not keeping up. Yeah, yeah okay. Just look at the, yeah. the number of that records. On this pessimistic view, right? <clears throat> well, but there's a there's another issue here too, right, which is that at some level this isn't an identity problem, right? So both privacy and identity depend on an underlying layer of security, and security is hard, right? So w there is, in a certain sense, that's not our problem as, as the identity community I'm in both, right? But in another sense, it sort of is our problem to design identity mechanisms which depend less and less on security, right? right? And that's you know, where these sort of behavioral and observational and contextual methods that don't rely on secrets and don't rely on things that are easily replicatable by bad guys are going to be very helpful in the future. <laughs> well, it's a case of identity or def, you know, security in, in depth, right? Defense in depth is really what we need. So if the one thing that people want to reuse again and again for their own security and happiness is their password. And you've designed a system that has all sorts of bells and whistles and, and bear traps and you know mm -hmm. whatever you have. But the one thing that someone can walk in right up in the front door with is the one thing that everyone wants to give away and reuse everywhere, then you've got a problem, right? There's a first order problem here, which is don't solely rely on passwords, right? If you are, then why have all the other stuff, yep. right? Well, akin to the IRS, which is like, don't solely rely on dynamic KBA for a certain set of processes. It's great here, it's not great here, and we can misapply the tools that we already have, too. Where was the place where it was great? I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> I was being generous. Yeah. No, it's, it is useful. It is useful. I'd like to know this matches to some set Lots of records of out bad there. bad guys find it very useful. Well, yeah, all right. <laughs> Simmer down, bank boy. So it's, it's a multi-layer problem, though, right? I mean, this is what you guys are saying. That, and when you have malware that is so sophisticated that even somebody who is pretty savvy can get fooled by it, then you know, it's pretty easy to give up your password, even when you don't really intend to and you're really good about it. So it's, it's a, that's a huge problem, because the hackers and the people who fish for these things have gotten better and better and better at this and much more sophisticated at it, which is why we need something that's a bit more robust than, well, you know, and then you, then you do have people who are doing, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, and that, that's... Right. Well, like, and I would agree with the multiple layers, and you say, you know, uh, risk-based, you know, transaction modeling, but then, hey, we're supposed to be the experts in that layer that is identity, so then I think we have to take the responsibility for that. Uh, you know, how many years have we been trying to work on client certificates? So, you know, poor people 20 years ago would still work on that one, and we haven't figured it out yet. Well, but, you know? I mean, so that's more or less my point, right? We I, should stop trying to use underlying infrastructures that are manifestly unsuitable to the task, and, and instead, you know, do something that's a little more as, decoupled. As pessimistic as I am, I'm not completely that point. I, well, I want to do it all. How well, about that? Well, I, I want to, I, so I don't want 
the solution of every hard problem to depend on the solution of every other hard problem, yeah. right? That's, that's basically <laughs> that's my bottom line. That's, that's, right. yeah. that, that's a great note. to take a while. That, that's a great <laughs> note to end this on, because we are yeah. absolutely just out of time here. So I want to thank this great panel, and thanks for everyone for coming, because it's the end of the day, and I appreciate yeah, it. Just a couple of thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. We're good. You can stay up here if you'd like. Actually, stay up here. Yeah. Stay up here. Hey, do I have uh, John and Roger here? You guys here? All right, so uh, just a couple of more, just a couple of moments and then we're gonna leave. So six o'clock tonight, we are, as I said, just a, kind of across the way. If you guys aren't already staying at the lodge, we're gonna be kind of on the ground floor of the lodge. We'll start at uh, six o'clock. And, uh, but before I do that, I was just gonna um, egg you on, I guess, a little bit. So like a good movie, when you discover uh, things that change your life, and, uh, but not things, really people that change your life. You, uh, you like to share them. And so we have lots of little traditions here at CAS. If you've been to many, you've seen them. It's kind of quirky. I like to add them over time. Things by accident happen next thing you know. They happen twice, like uh, Todd rapping to Eminem last night. It was just kind of a random little moment. No one was standing around, but he and his family are pretty darn awesome. And, um, and next thing you know, it just kind of becomes a tradition. By the third year, if Todd comes back, I don't know if you're here in the audience, Todd, it becomes a tradition. So one of my little traditions several years ago was uh, Vicky, who is here, who uh, worked for Ping for a number of years, introduced me to a couple of guys in the back of the room, and uh, they became a big part of my life. And it's boot camp, it's like the craziest thing ever. But of course, when I travel, I don't do exercise. And when I'm at home, I say I, don't, I have no excuses. I show up, and they are my outsourced willpower. I pay some money, and they tell me what to do. I don't have to think about how long I'm working out or what it is. And then when I'm on the road, I didn't have anything. So one year I said, well, I'm just going to have the guys out, and we're just going to do a boot camp and see who shows up. And of course, everyone's like, what do you mean it's a conference of boot camp? And there's kids running around too. What's, what, what's up with that? And so every year, we've kind of done it. And, uh, and so I've got John and Roger. We, we fly them. We fly them everywhere. I mean, we had them up to Napa, we had them to Monterey, and every year we end up getting, you know, 30 or 40 suckers to come out that morning <laughs> and like figure out, you know, what the hell is going on. And last year we were literally sitting in the bay. I didn't think they would actually do this, but you know, they did because that's who they are, and it was fun. And the year before that, you know, we were up in Vail and we did this big old adventure through the mountain. And it's, at the end of the day, it's not that hard. And frankly, it's just kind of special. And every year I wonder, should I call it boot camp or should I call it an adventure run? Or maybe you just want to get out and cruise around a little bit with some friends. And I was like, ah, oh, hell, no matter what I call it, everyone calls it boot camp. So anyway, I thought I'd introduce you to Rodri and John. We're going to do it tomorrow morning. It's at 6 o'clock. Is that 6? Is that 6.30 tomorrow? Why don't you guys come up here for just a moment? They can uh, share a little bit about, you know, what they do or what we're going to, I don't even know what we're going to do tomorrow because the hotel forbids everything, I think, <laughs> right? And uh, so if we can intrigue you a little bit to kind of come out tomorrow morning and have a little bit of fun, I'd like to do it. But most importantly, I just wanted to introduce you to two amazing individuals, definitely people that have had a huge positive impact uh, in my life. And like I said, it's just a little bit of a gift to share with all of us. So with that, I'll just hand it over. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm actually a technophobe, so I feel really out of my comfort zone here. Um, so, Rogue Consulting Group, uh, John and I's business, um, is based around the philosophy of providing authentic experiences for its participants um, through some level of hardship. Fitness is just a small, actually it's a very small part of what we do, um, but Andre has obviously explained uh, the connection and why he brings us to the event. When you guys come here, um, the goal is to develop business relationships. Um, well, I implore you to come to our event tomorrow because there's an opportunity to take that relationship to a deeper level um, or a more personal level. And I'll provide you an example of that. Um, not four hours ago, I was talking to uh, Andy Hindle, uh, who's the, uh, the content chair for the uh, CIS 2015. And the first thing he said to me was, he said, oh, Rodri, how are you going? Good, good, good. Um, he said, oh, you'd never believe this. Oh, he's sitting right here. Hey, buddy. Um, he said, it's true, right? I'm not making this up. <clears throat> so he said to me, uh, he said, last year, he said, um, uh, one of my boot camp teammates, we, uh, we, kinda, we hit them real hard last year, which was a lot of fun. But um, they, they, because of the kindred experience, the shared experience, they hadn't telephoned each other in a year, no email, no correspondence, nothing. 
Uh, at the beginning of the week, they locked eyes. They immediately went up to each other, uh, each other and because of the shared experience they had with us in San Francisco last year, there was an instant connection. And ultimately, that is not only good for business, um, it is good for the individuals. And business is not about business. Business is about people. And Rogue Consulting Group, we, uh, we're good with people. So if you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, um, then you can seek us out with the guys in the blue shirts. <clears throat> I'm the good looking one. This is the ugly guy right here. Um, <clears throat> um, but um, we, we encourage you to come out tomorrow. It'll be real. It'll be fun, but it won't be real fun. <laughs> uh, I'm going I'm, I'm to hand it over to John real quick. Wow, Welsh. <laughs> I've been dealing with this for many, many years. Uh, I'm just going to make it really quick. I know you guys want to get ready for the event, but uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you to Andre. It's been many, many, many years of enjoyment, and our friendship has grown, and, uh, and we, it's a highlight of our year every year, so we look forward to it. Um, he also mentioned one word, and that was excuse, early on in this, this discussion, and no excuses. So if you're nervous, get up. If you're tired, get up. If you're hungover, get up. We'll make sure it's fun. Uh, all abilities will uh, we'll incorporate. Don't worry about your fitness level, just show up. We'll have a lot of fun, a uh, little bit of games, a little bit of laugh a little bit of yelling, and uh, it'll be fun. So thanks again. Yeah. yeah, we look forward to seeing you all. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. <laughs>